Hello, everyone, and welcome to Arts Quest at Home. Uh, we thank you so much for coming uh, here to uh, this um, incredible presentation we're about to have. You guys can hear me, right? Somebody give me a thumbs up. I'm coming through. Yeah, okay, great. Hello, I'm Anthony DeSang, the Cinema Specials here. I'll be uh, leading this talk back, uh, asking questions to uh, Lisa and Jared. Uh, we thank you so much for coming to this incredible Arts Quest at Home program. Um, if you like what we're doing and want to see more of it, uh, please consider make, uh, making a donation to uh, artsquest.org uh, slash donate. And if not, hey, we're just happy you're here enjoying the stuff we're putting out. So uh, I am going to unmute Lisa and Jared, possibly. Hold on, it, my thing may be betraying me. <laughs> Lisa, you're unmuted. I am unmuted. Jared, I'm unmuting you. I think. Yeah. He, okay. There we go. All right, guys. Uh, so now uh, to talk the booksellers, uh, we have Lisa Harms here from ArtsQuest and Jared Ash, uh, who is a librarian at the Metropolitan Art Museum. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I sure didn't butcher that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and so for anybody watching, uh, just so you know, the best way to get the maximum entertainment out of this is to watch this in speaker view, not gallery view. Uh, it makes for a much more enjoyable presentation. Uh, our, minds, our minds are primed to go to gal uh, gallery view, but go to speaker view. That is all. Okay. So, uh, Lisa, Jared, I guess what I have to ask uh, first is um, the movie. Did you enjoy it? Uh, did it bring back memories? Uh, your thoughts on the movie overall? Uh, whoever wants to go first. Uh, sure, I'll jump in first. Um, so yeah, for me, uh, you know, definitely there was a lot of uh, nostalgia tied into the movie because um, I worked with Jared. Um, I worked at the uh, Watson Library at the Metropolitan Museum of Art for about 13 years um, before moving back to uh, the Lehigh Valley and joining ArtsQuest. So, uh, there were a lot of moments where uh, there's a lot of poignancy in terms of like just when they were scanning the, the various bookshelves and looking at some rare book bindings um, and just that world overall. Um, my role at the Met was primarily um, access and reference and, uh, you know, interacting with the public and, and helping them find it, find what they need. Um, so it was just really interesting and, um, you know, really interesting conversation around the shift from uh, the kind of analog side of book selling into, um, you know, the, the newer uh, technology based uh, version of that. And um, so, you know, looking forward to talking a little bit more about that tonight. But overall, I thought really, uh, you know, nice comprehensive look um, at different aspects of book selling and how it's how it's changing. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I was just, I mean, I, I enjoy, you know, um, books in general i i do read um i'm more of a movie guy now if you can't tell yeah. um but uh you know i mean like seeing this stuff always just fascinates me to the sense of like you, you learn so much history and it's like it's a you're you i'm always amazed at the stuff that i don't know and it's like i can't believe i never knew that this this was happening you know um jared your thoughts on the film um how did it make you feel um I mean, I, I loved it. I always love, you know, getting um, exposure and kind of that insight and see these um, people profiled and featured and brought to a wider recognition. Um, especially a lot of the people featured in this film are people that uh, we deal with and, and we actually buy from um, for the Met uh, and Watson Library at the Met uh, pretty regularly. And um, for those who we don't buy from, we have very good positive relationships from. And so even a lot of the younger dealers, um, some of the uh, more experienced or kind of older dealers as well. Um, it was great. It was something, um, a movie I've been really excited uh, to see and when it was in production. Um, and this was actually the first time I got to, to watch it. So it was great. It was, um, but it was also, you know, it, it for me uh, brought to mind and reminded me of a lot of the reasons why I didn't become a dealer it was because it is so hard and kind of, um, you know, it was something I started off in this business like 25 years ago. Um, and again, kind of just the same way that people were like, I didn't know this world existed or kind of that Rebecca Romney, one of the younger dealers was like, she just happened upon, you know, a job posting. And suddenly there was kind of the serendipitous opening to the trade. Um, and it was really, uh, and, and so I started working for a rare book dealer and thought, wow, this is something maybe I could do. And then realized it's so hard and it's such a, a risk. And um, 
was something that kind of got confirmed at the very end of the film. So um, as they say, we need this again. And uh, so it was something, it was, it was great to see. Um, it was exciting to see how kind of eager and into it um, and really charged and energized and optimistic um, the younger dealers are. Uh, and it was to, to know, um, it was really kind of exciting to see that. And, and they definitely had a very much a, uh, and even a, a different perspective than kind of some of the, the older people who really were saying, you know, the internet kind of killed the business and stuff. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was great. I was really intrigued by the fact that like, they say towards the end of the movie that like, the older generation blames the younger generation on the fact that not enough people, like they don't buy books anymore, but all those dealers, like the younger dealers are saying, no, we are the ones buying books. Yeah. Like, what do you think of this? I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I kind of feel like, I always feel like generations blame other generations on everything. Uh, you know, the young blame the old, the old blame the young. But like, I mean, from your perspective, what do you think? Are younger generations buying books and reading and, I mean, they, they definitely are. And this was, um, I, you know, I, and it's one of the things, I guess one of the shortcomings of the film is that they didn't caption it or they didn't kind of put up titles or IDs when people started speaking. So you really don't know who people are. So I spent a good, you know, 20 minutes trying to go through, searching like IMDB for like who the cast is, looking at the things and trying to match people. Because even though I knew a lot of the dealers, some people who said really interesting things or, or some people who said things I disagreed with, I was trying to kind of um, triangulate and figure out who they were. So um, I still don't know who the guy with the shaved head was. And he was the guy who said, oh, these people don't yeah. have the patience. Nobody has the patience to go and look at a, at a shelf, you know? Yeah. And uh, they just want what they have. And I was like, that's so not true, you know? Um, and that's not what any of these people are kind of seeing. And it's, it's um, fine. There are book fairs. There's this artist book fair. They showed some kind of a, at PS1 every year. Um, but even these smaller book fairs, not the Armory Fair, which is, you know, cost a dealer, Ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollars to participate in for three days, um, but there are these smaller fairs where people can go and get a table. Um, and there's a lot of browsing, and there's a lot of kind of people who are really enjoying on stumble upon kind of things. Um, I do see we have a, a participant or somebody who I don't know I can call her up, a Kara Schessinger, who is the book conservator and kind of the box builder um, here. So she can also, if we have any questions maybe and know, yukari is on as well yukari, yukari from too. the Met conservation lab is on as well <laughs> oh wow okay so guys uh if anybody on this chat uh one has any questions they want to ask feel free to message me and anybody uh that has connections to lisa or jared if you want to come on yeah also message me and i will unmute you and we'll we'll get really involved okay so just message me saying you have no problem coming on and we'll um we'll go from there um, so I had a question, uh, this is just more of like, there was, I mean, like I said, this world is new to me, but I recognized the woman who, um, I recognized the woman with the, the bob cut and the glasses. Mm -hmm. I've seen this woman somewhere and I don't know where. It, it, could you help me, either of you? Who is this person? Is that, is it Fran Lebowitz? Yeah. I guess, yeah. Is that her uh, name? Yeah. 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 Has she been in movies or t on TV or? She's a writer. She was recently, she was on one of the late night, I don't know if it's Stephen Colbert, maybe Stephen Colbert uh, or Jimmy Fallon. She was on some late night show recently. Yeah. Um, okay. But she's like New York, right? She I mean, she's kind of like. New York, yeah. New York writer, like, and I will say one of the things, you know, kind of early on in the film, um, you know, kind of going back to nostalgia, but not so much uh, from being a librarian and working with, you know, rare books or, or in that world, but um, when they talked about Book Row and they talked about the Strand and the early days, you know, I moved to New York in 98. So that's like, I wasn't there in, you know, the seventies or eighties or anything, but even in, in that time, um, and my husband and I were talking about this, like it kind of didn't matter what industry you were in or what you did for a living in New York. Like it was a very New York thing. Like my husband bartended and worked in film. It's like, he would get up at noon after like bartending all night and go to the Strand for like, just, just to hang out and, and other, <laughs> stores on book row and, you know, get a couple books and then go sit and have a beer before he started to shift. Like that was a very New York um, kind of thing to just be able to go and browse at the Strand or, you know, Shakespeare and Company they mentioned in, which was one of my, uh, another friend that worked there. So a lot of places um, that had that vibe that you could just kind of go and the people there, I forget who said if it was friendly Woods or not, but like, they weren't there to necessarily like they weren't the librarian they weren't there to, like help you find what they were there to sit and kind of like either they were curating their collection or reading it was just like 
no, you just, you go and you find and, and the serendipity of it, which, um, you know, ties very nicely in with the library side of things and, um, you know, what, what there is to be said about having Amazon make a suggestion for you versus actually going to stacks and being able to see books next to each other in a way that's been arranged um, sensibly to catalogers and librarians. But, um, you know, that whole aspect of, of New York, um, which is still there, but, you know, definitely has dwindled in the last, uh, you know, 20 years. Huh. I say even my 15-year-old my, um, son, who, uh, and we're in like central Jersey, but the thing that's killing him most about, you know, this whole thing and COVID is, is that we can't go to the Strand bookstore because that was his, like, that was his thing. Like, he yeah. wanted, that was his, like, special thing. He would go, and he wouldn't, like, just go and browse, like, you know, graphic novels or something. He went down to the basement, which is where it's all the used books. It's all, like, nonfiction. It's all, like, sciences and whatever. He was looking for just kind of those random things that are probably not even going to be in, like, libraries because they were kind of weeded from for being kind of like either out of date or obscure or not really circulating. Um, and I think that's something that's still, yeah, whether it's the analog, whether it is this nostalgia, but um, yes, even this interest in old books and collecting and appreciation. I mean, um, two of the, the collectors, Heather and, and Rebecca, who are both um, Honey and Wax, they sponsor a, a young collectors club for young um, women collectors. Um, and there are a lot of organizations like the, um, for college age collectors and things. So there is definitely this, this drive and this interest in the browsing and the appreciating kind of these things. Hmm. So let me ask you uh, in your history of, you know, um, was there ever, <laughs> what, was there ever like a great find or something really rare you came across? Like what is the rarest thing you've seen, either of you? I'm going to pitch that to Jared. I will say, because this is his area of expertise. I will say, though, in working at the Met all those years, um, not that I, I mean, I found in the stacks, but uh, we had, at, we have at the Watson Library at the Met, um, a rare book cage. Like, literally, the rare books are caged under lock and key, or swipe, oh. I guess now. Um, but the, um, the original Black Panther uh, magazines, Jared, I guess we still have those in the collection there. That was, I just came across those one day um, and had, and it's like the original like hand painted um, illustrations. Um, so that's the kind of thing like you come across and it's pretty uh, like just, you know, takes your breath away. Um, and then they also mentioned the Da Vinci, like the Codex the Hammer. And, you know, we had the facsimiles of those there too. And I remember, uh, Carmen Bombach, who is a uh, curator uh, at the Met, who's probably the leading world expert on Da Vinci, and helping her find those, well, helping her get those out of the book cage one day because they were gigantic. And she just kind of stood there and like was talking to me about what all these drawings, the interpretation of these, uh, and, and the scientific relevance, and as well as the art relevance. And um, those were two I remember specifically kind of seeing not acquiring but just finding and just thinking like oh wow this is this is not something you would get as an experience online on your laptop it's totally different in person with the physical uh you know tactile thing in front of you but jared i'm sure is way more <laughs> there, there are some pretty um you know wonderful things two things kind of stand out one is um one actually came to the Met, one, one's at the Met, and it's from um, actually the bookseller Dave, um, the guy who plays on eight baseball, eight softball teams, who showed the big, huge fish book, mm. um, and who was driving his bike with, riding his bike with the two huge portfolios kind of strapped to the back, um, mm. just kind of how he does his deliveries. And, um, but so we have a, a sample book from, um, and we, we get some wonderful, mostly like trade catalogs from him. Um, he one of our absolute treasures in the collection of Watson is a book, it was kind of a showroom um, sample catalog of glass, uh, kind of um, decorated glass from Paris from the 30s. Um, and there were some samples in there that were actually used in the Metro, the Paris Metro. Uh, and that came from Nave and there. The only one we've been able to find um, in it, other than the one we own is, is at the, the company archives. It's a uh, Saint-Cobain uh, Glassworks. Um, I always love telling stories like, oh my God, it's so great about how dealers, how they help tell, like build the collection. Um, they really are partners in this, as I think Kevin Young says from the Schoenberg. Um, and it's so great when they know you and they know your collecting tastes and like, here it is. And Dave just brought this book, was like, here you guys, this is for Watson, this is for the Met. 
And I found out recently that, and it is, we'd love to have it, but I found out recently that he had actually offered it to Winter Tour Library in Delaware um, <laughs> and had FedExed it. You know, this is this really fragile book with like all these little, little actual like glass sample pieces in there um, and sent it to them. And then um, it was out of scope for them because they only collect really American art and design. And so they sent it back and we got it. So it was still, we're, that's still one of the most exciting things that we have. And it's actually going to be in an exhibition soon at uh, Cooper Hewitt Museum on uh, Hector Guimard, the artist. Um, and then another one was this brochure. So, I mean, everybody talks about the internet and you're saying, oh, it's horrible now because um, what it did for a lot of dealers was people could kind of um, tell these stories or could kind of give things. There's like added value in, in dealers or sometimes finding a book and being able to kind of contextualize it or put it in context. And this is, you know, it might be this simple little catalog, but you give it a good enough and interesting enough story and make it seem like, oh my God, like, you know, you tie it to whatever was going on. It was 69, you know, even if it has nothing really to do with that, um, but it's kind of creating this thread. And then things like Bookfinder or other sites, you know, as you said, there are 10 copies of that online and they sell for 25 bucks. So all these books that people were selling for 150 or, you know, $200 are now $20 and 25 and $30. Um, but at the same time, there was, there was a lot of opportunity for discovery and, you know, the same people who would be digging for, whether it's dealers or collectors, to go digging kind of like in dank basements. You could also, in the early days, especially like eBay, you could find amazing things on there that were either, um, you know, just put up from, you know, Salvation Army or Goodwill bookstores or things that maybe were miscatalogued or especially when it came to artists or designers, um, things like misspellings. I was doing... I was personally doing kind of Russian avant-garde books and just seeing things went up. Um, often it was the cover designs that were of the most interest and it might've been some random, you know, kind of book on agriculture for the twenties, but it had a really incredible design by an artist like Alexander Rodchenko or Lisitsky, uh, Elisitsky. And I found this one super rare book. Um, it was a, a Japanese film designed by one of those artists, Elisitsky for maybe a couple hundred dollars, I think. And wound up, went to a dealer and she sold it for probably 10 times what she wound up telling me she could sell, you know, that what I wound up agreeing to give it to her for. Um, and I've never seen it again. And when I have, <laughs> there's one other copy and it's probably even like 30 times what she had sold it for. But um, yeah, so that was, those were the kind of the rarest things that, two things that really stand out. My God, that's, yeah. again, like there's so much history there. This whole thing just truly blows my mind. And it, it like, you know, we're in quarantine time, but like, I want to go, to New York and explore, explore these stores and obviously probably not be allowed to touch things, but you know, it would be great. Like we have a question. Oh, you can, and that's the whole thing. It's yeah. like, yeah. Okay, well that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Craig Smith. Um, so uh, do you feel that quarantining thanks to COVID-19 will lead to more book sales or less book sales thanks to all the extra time to explore the electronic media offerings? Kind of heavy question. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I recently heard um, some of the dealers who are featured in the film talking about how this is impacting them. They just did a recent Q and A. And um, a lot of what we're seeing, I mean, dealers often send books, book lists out kind of every Tuesday. There's a, a website called Ex Libris and dealers kind of will do their postings on Tuesdays. And for some dealers, this has been, as a lot of people are going through their house and kind of rediscovering things and photo albums and kind of cleaning house, it's, for some dealers, it's, it's given them a lot of time to kind of look within and kind of go through their material. And so cataloging kind of, there are some great big book lists coming out. Um, a lot of institutions are buying and, and um, you know, they're a pretty core component of, of who is buying this material um, from dealers institutions aren't at the libraries and librarians uh, and curators aren't at the libraries to actually physically receive the books. So dealers are holding them, but they're still, they have funds and endowed funds that can only be used for acquisitions. So they still have to buy stuff before the end of the year. So um, a lot of, at least on an institutional level, libraries are still buying depending on their situation. It's really, you know, across the gamut. It's a public university or a private. Um, I don't, people are, the appreciation of books, I think, is um, it's kind of been going either way. I mean, I think in the same way, um, yeah, I don't know if people are going through all their stock. I don't know they can't get 
uh, in terms of rare books, I'm not sure. It's probably giving people a lot more time to browse and search and kind of go after things. And um, on the non-rare level, I'm probably, uh, as libraries are closed, you know, I definitely people are probably borrowing. I mean, even figuring out how to download things from your library, from Hoopla or whatever else, you know, or, or um, any of those other things are pretty kind of, are not as straightforward as they, they could be. So it's still kind of much easier to order and, you know, shoot an order off Amazon.com. Um, although I will say if people are doing that, just knee-jerk reaction, there is Bookshop, I think it's bookshop.com, which is, mm all source it's basically like amazon you can get everything you would get at amazon but it's all coming from um all the proceeds are supporting independent booksellers oh. so i will kind of put that plug out there so kind of make that your default go to kind of um i think pricing is kind of about the same um so i don't know i don't know that i answered craig's question necessarily but um yes no. <laughs> yes yeah, <no. laughs> yes and no yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i would i mean i think like the you know, it is difficult because for someone like my, like my family, we are avid public library users. So, um, you know, we, as a librarian, people tend to think if you're a librarian or you've worked as a librarian that you have, you know, just miles and miles of books in your in your home. Um, we have, I've, as a family, we have just been big library users where we have a pretty well curated collection of um, things that we look at a lot or they're special to us. Um, my son is nine, though he will not get rid of any of his books. He has more books than my husband and I combined, or probably that we've ever owned in our lives. Um, but for us, you know, we we just get things out from the library and um, and return them. So, and my my husband's not a big ebook fan, um, so it has been challenging for. So he is now reading things that I have on my shelves typically that you know he's uh, recommended. Um, but I agree with Jared. I think. Even for people who are relatively savvy um, in terms of technology, I think the you know the ebook and the downloading process is still not as streamlined and, and straightforward as it could be, and people are challenged with that. Um, I loved uh, in the film when they talked about on um, the subway and the amount of people you know, and that's younger people reading physical books in the subway because that is a hundred percent accurate. I think that you, um, I was always amazed, and that you know, from working in libraries for you know over twenty years it's something that I had been told even in library school back in, you know, 2000, like, oh, you know, there, people aren't going to read real books anymore. You know, the internet's going to ruin everything. Libraries are not going to exist. And that's just not been the case. It, it, it is still not the case. I think libraries have continued to be nimble in terms of um, how they collect and how they instruct people. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that it's just going to continue to be a balance because what, I forget who made the point in the film, but the technology um, will get outdated quickly and, you know, the print will continue to go on. And, and that's not to say, like, to be a Luddite about it and say, like, you know, all, everything in print all the time, because I do think the access of having things digitized and access to ebooks is phenomenal. But um, I, I, can, I think it'll continue to be, uh, you know, both worlds. Um, but it is interesting to see you know more about what people are reading um, during the quarantine, just like on social media, people posting what they're reading. But um, you know, yeah, I think people are digging into their shelves for things that they bought and never read and forgot about. So that's a good thing, I guess. Yeah, yeah. When you said about libraries, like I definitely think now that, I mean, I, I like you. I, I assume you were you're in Bethlehem, so Bethlehem Public Library. I go there. Well, I mean, not right now, but. You know, that place is always, it's yeah. full of people. I've never yeah. seen that place not busy when I've been there. Like, there's definitely still that balance. People, I think there's just something about print that I think people are fascinated by. So, it's, I, I'm a fan. <laughs> and I um, think, you know, li public libraries particularly, um, you know, and the Bethlehem Library, which does a tremendous job of this, and obviously so many of the public libraries in New York, um, Brooklyn, and, and NYPL, but you know, it, it's so much more than just the collections there too. I mean, just in terms of um, as a convener of the community, in terms of the programming, um, exhibitions, you know, we partner, ArtsQuest partners with our life, with Bethlehem Mary Public Library for art shows and for talks and things like that. So that's, I think that, you know, particularly during the quarantine, um, people are missing out on being able to go and browse and get books, but also just going there and being with people or, or not, you know, you know, because you can do either, and and that that's the great thing about um, that's the great thing about libraries. So, 
I think that is something that is really being, people are feeling that loss during the quarantine. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely am. Um, so I guess I want to backtrack a little bit and just ask you guys, like, I, I hope this isn't a long question, but um, like what, you have to tell me your life story, but like what got you into this direction? You know, what, made you want to move forward with this as your career? You know, what made you realize the magic of books and, you know, and now Lisa, you are our senior director of visual arts and education, but what led you to this? You know, tell me your life story in five minutes. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go, I'll go first and keep mine because I'm not working as a librarian now. So I'll, I'll, you know, mine's more, ends more abruptly. Um, well, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I was uh, studying, I went to, um, I grew up in Lehigh Valley here, but I went to, um, University of Pittsburgh for my undergraduate uh, and was majoring in psychology and, and women's studies actually but working as a work-study student in the uh, psych library and um, like a lot of people I think that get into libraries you kind of find a job there whether it's in college or an internship um, and uh, was a big you know public library uh, goer as a child too but uh, there was something about you know being able to work directly with people and um, you know I was not a behind-the-scenes person I was kind of the one that you see when you walk into the library and can help you get what you need. Um, but really what prompted me was that I moved to New York and um, with that degree could not find a job. <laughs> so realized I could fall back on working in the library. So I, I started at Columbia uh, University um, in the libraries there where I was for about three years. Um, and uh, at that time realized that it was a career and that you could go to graduate school for, for library science. and. Um, and then I uh, saw a job listing at the Met, and like most people, as you know, Yukari and Jared are <laughs> that do not realize museums have libraries, uh, but they all do for the most part. Um, so I applied um, there, and uh, with that, that was in 2001, I believe. And uh, with that, I just found a, a love of um, the public services side of things and feeling like I was uh, helping people with discovery and finding that really one that unique thing and it's really even for the Met which um, is you know an art historical collection or, or encyclopedic collection of, of what the Met has uh, just the, the range of people I would help on a daily basis um, and so that prompted me to then go to uh, Pratt Institute um, which does have a library science major and uh, you know stayed on at the Met until um, I moved back to the Valley actually continued there for a couple of years and uh, and then was uh, at the National Museum of Industrial History and then made the switch over to ArtsQuest. But a lot of what I had done in that world still, you know, the research aspect of things and kind of from a programming standpoint, a lot of what I do, I still rely on my librarian skills to do those things. Awesome, that's awesome. Um, Jared, your story. <laughs> And Lisa, I'll just say what you know, once a librarian, always a librarian. And so even if you're not working as this one now <laughs> for life, you know. Um I um my undergraduate uh for undergraduate degree, I studied uh, Russian studies and I was particularly interested in a period of, of um, very obscure small kind of um niche period from like nineteen tens to the thirties, so kind of right around the times of the revolution and uh, Russian avant-garde specifically. So artists like Kazmin Malyevich. Um, it was just a really dynamic circle of people, artists and poets and musicians, everybody working together, kind of given free reign to just do something completely new and different, like around the time of the revolution. And um, never in a million years thought I could actually find work doing anything with that. And I was planning on going to um, live in Moscow or something and work for some consulting firm or do some finance something or other, because um, that's where really the jobs were and then by chance I was staying with a friend in New York and went to a gallery um, to see an exhibit that was listed in the Village Voice and uh, it was a gallery they had an exhibit up of photographs by this guy Mayakovsky photo behind me but and I was asking um, pictures or I was asking questions of the gallery director I was like so is this something or other she's like wait you know this stuff and I was like yeah and she's like well um, you and I kind of told her, I was like, Yeah, actually, I did a thesis on these guys. She's like, Well, do you want a job? <laughs> She's like, Would you ever want to do translation? So, and it was a gallery that specialized in photography and rare books. And um, I, you know, I think I got like 
they paid $8.50 an hour or something, but I was doing research, I was getting to handle these books. I mean, I remember the feeling of like this guy, Mayakovsky, like in, with this inscription given to this other person. It's like, oh my God. And I felt this like charge of like, this was in his hands. This was like inscribed, this was in his hands and then was in like her hands, you know? And he like gave it to her and just how exciting and how um, much of a direct connection it felt um, that books gave to these, these people. And then I kind of just, um, it was really a pleasure and a joy to kind of just be around the material. It was so rare that um, there wasn't a lot of English language secondary research or kind of people hadn't written about this stuff. And after being in this gallery and working with material long enough, I kind of came to develop some kind of expertise and then was doing other work for some other dealers um, because dealers and collectors were selling and buying this stuff but didn't speak Russian because they were kind of picture buying it for pictures or illustrations or, um, you know, because first editions or whatever. And um, found that, that I really, you know, kind of carved something out doing this. Um, but I was always, and then after that, I really just always wanted to work with the books and I kind of became more of an, more of an art scenario and I wound up being hired to be a curator for this collection of that material that went to MoMA. Uh, I worked at MoMA for about a year um, doing this catalog uh, and preparing an exhibition and realized that I just enjoyed um, books and kind of um, book culture and book world more than kind of art museum world. Um, didn't realize I didn't have to choose between the two or that being an art museum librarian allowed me to kind of do both. Uh, and then after doing all this, I realized I had to get a library science degree to continue to work with the material, even if I wanted to do cataloging or anything. Um, and it was always just something for me, this, this, the search, I mean, it was kind of like, a, in the end we hear, you know, the thing that like that Adam Weinberg burger dealer loves is like the hunt, the search, the discovery, you know, he's going to go digging through those moldy boxes of books because maybe he's going to find that thing. And he was saying, you know, he hates the business part of it. He hates the selling, you know, he hates having to actually like place a book and like, you know, get paid and pay rent. Um, and kind of being a librarian allows you to do that. I mean, I, I have the same joy in kind of the discovery and the search. Um, even doing my thesis or research papers in college, it was always about finding the citations. You know, I always wanted to do the bibliographic, the tracking down, the finding sources, kind of, um, and now it's it's getting the physical things to provide that material for researchers. Like it's much less interest in the final product. I don't wanna find a book and then have to sell it. I wanna find the book and maybe get it in the collection. And it's always nice to be able to spend an institution's money, you know, to buy that book rather than your own. Um, and that's kind of the end of the process and the sharing, but that's kind of how, you know, came my, my path to present position. And just, I want to quickly point out, Jared made a really good point about, um, you know, just the, the idea of buying, uh, acquiring something for a collection when you are in a library. Um, you know, I think there has been for years this idea that the library and librarians are the keeper of the books and, you know, they have them under lock and key and, you know, they are the keepers of knowledge. And, um, you know, I don't know, I, that probably has been the case in the past. Um, I would say that is, uh, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, opposite of that nowadays. Like I think most librarians, even working with rare books, um, strive to create uh, opportunities for access, whether that's through digitization or changing po policies around access or things like that. But, um, you know, this idea that, um, you know, that there's this one unique thing and, and you have it. And they were kind of relating that in the movie a little bit to the art world and like, okay, the sign, you know, wealth or, you know, that I, I own this thing and, and I own it because, and, and so you can't have it. I bought it, you know, when they talked about auction and, um, and so that's, I think, you know, one of the, uh, the great ways that, um, you know, there, there's something about a joy in, in acquiring a book for a collection that you can then put into a broader context or, or you know, meet a need of a, a specific, uh, you know, department or an individual or something, but it tells the kind of larger story. But that, that access piece and what, you know, the, what the internet and digitization has been able to do for access to people who, you know, can't get to your library or don't have the funds to purchase that that item um, is just phenomenal. I mean, the, especially during the quarantine. I mean, the the digitization projects that you're seeing happening right now with, you know, museums and uh, you know libraries is, is just phenomenal. The amount, the just the amount of content that's being out there, it's almost overwhelming. Um, so that's I think a big part of it too is that like the librarian, um, you know, the shift towards providing more access than than restricting it. So 
I want to go back to this. Also, that parallel, I mean, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead, Jared, go ahead. Please, I insist. <laughs> I was just going to say, and there's also that parallel, uh, sure. Um, even in the movie, the booksellers are saying uh, it was the Jay Walker who was the head of, um, who had that private, crazy, unbelievable MC Escherich library who was, you know, he was, was like, mm -hmm. who is this guy? Um, which was amazing. And he's the founder of Priceline.com, I guess, is like how he, where oh, that really? money came from. Yeah, um, which I, I had never heard of him. I didn't know, you know, that was the detective work about who is this guy um, after the watching it. But, um, you know, he was talking about the really good dealers, you know, they're in it for the hall, like so much of what they do when they show at fairs, it's about the education and the instruction and the sharing, you know, they're showing people things and they, when they do these fairs, they're happy to kind of pull a book out and let somebody look through it. You know, even Fran Leibowitz was saying like, people are like, no, please go ahead, turn the pages of that $85,000 book. You know, and because it is, yeah. it's, it's the way to, to create that buy-in. Um, and there's nothing like it. I mean, you can see things digitized, but uh, even when we have classes come in to, to Watson, which Lisa was very instrumental in getting these people to come in and, and for us to kind of expand it on that to show them these things. I mean, they're amazed, you know, because you see a book and you see the way that the ink lays on the page and this shimmer kind of old printing. And it's just not anything that ever comes across. Um, even kind of these deep, you know, black, like woodcut books from the 15th, hundreds, um, it's not the same. You can see it digitized, but it's it's really not the same. And um, people are really kind of just awed by them. And so kind of showing them, um, putting them out there, but there is that common thread between booksellers and librarians about making the material accessible and sharing it with them. Um, and as somebody said, like, you know, they, they've held up for 500 years. Like a lot of them, good paper, like handled carefully can be touched and held. And, you know, that, that was a question I had is because it, it just kind of felt like, I mean, maybe I base this off of what I know of the Declaration of Independence, which is, you know, under lock and key and all that kind of stuff. Right. But like, yeah. paper can last that long, like just, this is probably a science question, but like, you know, with people touching it and all that without, you know, going up. <laughs> we should ask yeah, Kari or Kara about that, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you probably care. Do you guys want to come on? I mean, shoot me a message if you do. I mean, I won't just, you know, start your video because, you know, that's rude. But if you, if you want to come on, please, we'd love to talk to you. Um, just shoot me a message in the chat. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just fascinated by like, you know, how things can stand the test of time. Like, you know, how long things can last and be usable and all that. Like I, one time, you card, you want to come on? Give me a thumbs up if you do. <laughs> Uh, Cara you, said you sure. Dare. Okay. All right. I think that is a, you Cara, give me a thumbs up if you want to come on just as high as you can or a thumbs down. We'll take, all right. I think that's a yes. Oh. And Mary. Okay. Hold on. We have a, I'm going to unmute Mary first. Mary. Hello. How are you? I think I unmuted I'm, you. I'm fine. Thanks. I'm really enjoying your, <laughs> okay. Hi. I'm enjoying your conversation. I, I haven't had a chance to see the movie. I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, if you'll just permit me, I do have a little plug for my, my, my own book that just was self-published uh -huh. this year. It's, uh -huh. it's Seattle's, Seattle's Used Bookstores, 1999 and 2019, A Love Note to Book Culture and the Pre-Digital Age. So it was, it was through Ex Libris, self-published, um, but it deals with, with used bookstores in Seattle. Um, I did a project in 99, you know, just four years after Amazon was conceived, before it had taken off, before social media, before the, the boom, and, and I went back last summer and revisited some of it, so again, I, I just, just real quick, because this is not about me, but I thought some of you might be interested, <laughs> and that's all, it's available on Ex Libris, um, I'm, you know, it's, it's an echo chamber, I mean, I, I, these sentiments in the book are things you all are talking about right now, but in the context of the used bookstore in Seattle, with the 20 year spread just before and after the tech boom, so, so, so that's all, so thank you, that's all, you can get back to your, your, your conversation, <laughs> okay. No, thank you for sharing it, that's, that's um, amazing, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Oh, that's it's, it's small. It's 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 small, really. Just just a love note, you know, self-published, just a labor of love. That's all it was. So thank you. Um, <laughs> where were we? Uh, Zoom. Okay. Yeah. You you can you can mute me now. I will go on. So just mute me. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm going to unmute Yukari and Kara. Come on in. All right. Welcome, guys. How's it going? 
Hey. Good. Good to see you guys. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, Derek, I Lisa, thank you. I oh, man. <laughs> So, can you hear my internet? Do you guys want to talk about? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Anthony, the one thing I was thinking. We all froze. Oh. Um, hold on. Darren, I am <laughs> unmuting you. There we go. All right. Uh, yeah, you, Kari, Kara, we can hear you. Kara, uh, what were you saying, Kara? Oh, I'm just listening to the comments that were being made earlier. Um, uh, one of the things that's really struck me, I, I have a booth at, um, I do three local book fairs over the course of the year. So I get to meet and work with booksellers, with some of the people who are in the documentary, and also with collectors, um, people who are acquiring books for their own private collections, and also with just lay people, people who are interested in books or love books and are just thinking about what it might mean to collect or what a rare book might mean. And there are two aspects of the generational divide that really fascinate me. Um, I, I, I use the word divide, but I probably shouldn't. One thing is that when I look at the lay people who come to me and want books repaired or want to know what can be done, can a book be saved? Sometimes they can, sometimes they're so brittle they can't. But the young people who are coming to me, sometimes some of them are so young, literally this one guy came to me at book fair and he was looking at the table and I thought, the poor thing, you must be so bored. And he said, I collect books and I'm starting to sell them online and I have this one 17th century Bible that I'm interested in maybe having restored. Can you talk with me about what might be involved? And I thought, this is, fantastic. And I see that not just with young people who want to start dealing, but young people who will come to me and say, I just bought this amazing book of poems by E.E. E. Cummings, and it's a first edition, and it's a second printing, but I love it, and can you fix it for me? It's the first book, and I want to have a collection someday. The older lay people who are coming to me say, I have a cookbook that belonged to my parents, or I have a family Bible. If they're not already collectors, the older people are coming in with something that has sentimental value. It's the younger people who are coming in wanting to treasure these books as artifacts and thinking about their future as artifacts, both in their collection and in an ongoing way. And along similar lines, I'm encountering more and more younger adults um, people in college, people in grad school who are saying they would rather read a physical book. They don't want to read a digital book. It's just not the same experience. They don't engage with the text in the same way. And increasingly they're saying to me, I'm writing my papers on a typewriter because there's no internet to interfere with it. And I can really think about the text and focus on my thoughts in a different kind of way. So I think it's wonderful what's happening with younger people. And, and books. And you know, maybe we're in a strange moment where digital is still overwhelming us all, but I see just an amazing future for books and their preservation and, and their life going forward. I, I, yeah, I completely agree. I think a lot of it is also like, you know, I think certain generations, you know, the younger generations, like we see all of these things digitally and, you know, it's great. We consume it. But I also think we do realize, like you said, technology has faults. It runs into lots of issues constantly. And there's nothing like physical media, books, music, you know, playing a record is amazing. I obviously spend a lot of money on Blu-rays. Butch Cassidy, great movie. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's just something I, I just truly feel that, you know, physical media doesn't let you down in any way. Also, it's just something special about consuming it that way. I mean, and yeah, I've, I actually, my grandfather has a first edition to kill a mockingbird. And that was how I read it. I was very careful with it. But like reading that first edition, huge smile on my face. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, I, I feel you just, you feel something. <laughs> There's a real sense of history there. So that's what I have. <laughs> so uh all right uh yukari let's bring you on um i'm gonna unmute you again 
Um, so I want to ask that question about, okay. uh, I, I guess one of you two are welcome to answer this, paper that books are printed on. Like, it can stand the test of time hundreds of years later. Like, how is this done? Help me out. <laughs> so you can run more zero. <laughs> 1,000 years, let's say. Is there paper 1,000 years? <laughs> yes, they are. Yes. Really? It's, um, they are surprisingly but to us not really 100 one thousand what um ink I mean, paper i don't know kara can help me everybody can help me i'm mumbling um paper yes in let's say asia at least i know japan like a century paper still exists and in europe uh maybe 15 centuries paper, yeah. maybe, right, 14, 15th century. In China, three, four century, century maybe. right, in China? Oh, that early. Ch um, Japan is like an 8th century, could be earlier. Paper studied before BC, I mean, before BC. BC. So I don't know, it's actual paper perfect shape of paper exists or not, I'm not sure. Um, but then, um, like the Arabic world, Arab world, they are a paper, definitely 12th century, um, yeah, 13th centuries. And the answer in the question, yes, paper can really uh, last such a long time. But around 19th century, there's a period the paper uh, production of paper changed. They use a different like, material, it's acidic uh, uh, material. So that uh, caused a lot of problem mm. in certain books or papers. But um, before and after people recognize that uh, that material creates problem, now it's changed the, the uh, choosing materials too. How's that? Yeah? Yeah, it was the wood. Um so actually older paper like kind of the older the paper the, the more durable and the stronger and kind of um it, it can be because it's before wood pulp was brought in and like so a lot of the like brittle newspapers and things from 19th century and the all the aesthetic stuff um i don't know if that's always the case but it was kind of more rag based or kind of cloth based paper right it kind of holds up better but i'm not concerned i should just be quiet and, and defer to, to you guys so okay so paper be made, luckily. So the newer paper after 20 centuries now, like a small, like a paper mill, they make a great paper. And there's still a uh, paper industry in Japan still going much, much smaller scale. Um, but through the nature environment changing, you know, air pollutions, and then those um, the really kind of climate also affect on the production materials also weaker like leather you know animal change what they eat what they live and then different quality of materials like could be said that older days probably better quality in certain i think situation Right. When the production of paper was industrialized, the sizing that they were using and the bleaching that they were using, all of that stuff in this period that Yukari mentioned where the paper really gets pretty awful and the leather gets awful in that period too, those chemicals that were used to make the paper or to tan or produce the leather, they're actually interacting with pollutants in the air. And that's why we get these books that are so brittle because they're becoming acidic from the inside out, really. So if you go back before that period, then yeah, you have these gorgeous books that are just so old that you could handle at the armory or these other book fairs. And they'll, they'll really be okay if they're handled carefully. And I think the, the Asian tradition of paper making that Yukari knows so much about, they didn't industrialize it in the same way. And the quality of paper, it goes back so much farther and it continues to today, these individual paper makers with, with heirloom traditions. I mean, the, the national treasure of paper makers in Japan and the products that they produce are just gorgeous. And then they will last another thousand years, those yeah. papers. Incredible. 
Well, thank you for answering that question. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we got some conservators on here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Yukari, um, Kari, did you, you watch the film? I mean, what did, what did you think? I mean, uh, what? Absolutely. Yes. Well, Karen was in it. Karen was in it. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, oh my God. Hey oh, right there. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Did you like your performance? I want to hear what Yukari thought. <laughs> well, you know, to be honest, I, I really found it's really fun film because the way you recognize like a book nerdy New Yorkers a lot in there, right? And then you see faces, familiar kind of faces. I'm a really good surprise to see you, Kara. I know you mentioned Joss, <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't realize so Kara was in the film. Yeah. So I only had about six minutes at the end. It was a tiny camera. There's a, there's a special so feature. Good. There's a special feature that's going to be on the DVD. And it's right now, it's on the fundraiser sites for ABAA and RBMS. Um, but it will be publicly available when the DVD comes out, more widely available, I should say. You have a really did you guys, did, did either of you cringe when you saw David Bergman holding up the fish book? <laughs> yes. Pulling it from that side. <laughs> That was one thing. There wasn't really a, that much handling or kind of mishandling in the book, but there was one scene where David Bergman, the, the, the softball guy with the big fish yeah. book, and he kind of picks it up from like the cover side. He's holding it. It's kind of like all that. That's not like, how you pick it up with every book. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. But you know, it it just it just goes to show that these books can be handled. I mean, the book didn't come yeah. apart in his hands. Right. He wouldn't have done that if he didn't know he could do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no. no, I understand definitely, you know, book should be handled definitely with the caution, but I know their feeling wanted to touch it. I know I have to kind of, you know, I don't, I don't need to fight if I recognize one over the other. Of course, beautiful print. I want to, I want to let a press beautiful touch it. But about I had, you know, more treasure <laughs> for a humankind. Okay, I should probably wait people touch it, but I totally understand. You, you just but touch it when not. nobody's around. You just right. touch it when nobody's around. And then I think the, the should be one helpful. of the things was, um, I was gonna ask you two about too, which was cool, was they started to talk about, you know, the book as object, and obviously you guys have a lot of experience in that area too, but they talked about fine bindings and, and jeweled bindings, and then um, the gentleman talked about bindings and, with the human skin and, and everything, um, and is that, is that, something that um, I know like just in terms of people searching collections but um, how often does that come up in your own work where you have something that uh, you know is so special or delicate whether it's you know something that's jeweled or whether it's the bind you know it, it, it is some kind of um, you know animal skin binding or something like that how what how what does that feel like when you guys come across something like that or is it old hat to you now <laughs> I have a question actually. Yes, so I remember he mentioned the books, it's a human skin. Mm -hmm. So is it true? Yeah. That one is the, the hall by and the dance of death with the, um, and with the human teeth inlays. Mm -hmm. And that's the guy, we actually, that's the same binder and Yukari is a conservator, I don't know that we said it, but at Watson Library. And there's, we have three books at Watson, um, Sinkorsky and Sutcliffe who did all the jewel bindings and it was that same binder. So who did those really over the top opulent ornate mm -hmm. things. It was the same binder who did the human skin. I don't know where, we did, they didn't go into asking where the skin came from. Um, but yeah, I know I think there's, I don't know how many there are, but it's definitely something that if you, you, if you Google it comes up as I think there have been, you know, um, whether it's Atlas Obscura or definitely people have talked about, you know, things found. In, 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 Because the book, when like he said the human skin, the book he was showing, like it looked like a goat or, but is that a book actually, book with human skin? I was not sure. Yes, yes, yeah. There, I, I've read about a number of these and when they try to authenticate them, a lot of them aren't. It's just not, a legend okay. that goes along with them. But there are a few mm -hmm. that really are. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, there are all sorts of questions that one then wants to ask. 
Yeah. <laughs> I've never encountered a book bound in human skin, and I've never been given a jeweled binding to handle, but I have repaired a number of Sangorsky and Sutcliffe books and, mm-hmm. and some others by those really fine binders. And um, often, I mean, Yukari talked about that period where the, the book production quality just collapsed. They were using such thinly paired leather that the boards fall off those books really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, you, you open the book the wrong way or the first time it slides off the table and onto your lap, not even the floor, those boards will fall off. So I, I do see a lot of those for repair. I'm sure Yukari sees very different sorts of books coming through the lab at, at Watson at the museum. Well, including that glass sample book that Jared mentioned, which is a real treasure. Yeah, treasure, I know. I think we are so, I I shouldn't say spoiled, but though, yeah, we have so many treasure books, but common goals, it's become, it's really still special, but it's kind of hard to pick one or two. So what treasure, no, so many. Yeah, that's in embroidery books, really fine, really delicate. Um, yeah, those are nice. That's also beautiful. And then we have a lot of uh, specimen book. It's beautiful papers and samples and yeah, materials. Um, also, we have a lot of artist book too. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah like a non-traditional materials books. Yeah. Guys, I'm gonna have to jump off, but thank you for including me. And thank you, Jared and Lisa and Anthony. This has been a great discussion. Uh, I'm really glad that you hosted this. And we had a star of the movie on here. That's fantastic. I know, it was amazing. Hardly a star. Amazing. Wow, thank you. Good for, to see you guys. For Thanks again. Wonderful thank you so much. Thanks for joining it. Yeah. So that actually is a good uh we are coming up on the hour. Um so if anybody has any last minute questions, feel free to put them in the next 30 seconds or so. Um but yeah, I guess we'll just we'll do some closing statements like, you know, um well first of all let me ask you this. Did you watch to the very end, the post credit scene? Did you see that the Fran Leibowitz? That was I had a good laugh at the very end with the, the cheap, about borrowing books. Did you see that part or no? Yes, yes, that was, that was pretty funny. Yeah, uh, I it was don't David know Bowie, I right? Know. David Bowie? Yeah, she basically you know. says that she hates letting people borrow books. And then she said she lent a book to David Bowie and he said, <laughs> I'll give it back. And he never gave it back. That's so. really funny. Yeah. And she said, you like, can just buy it. She said, don't buy it. She's like, no, yeah. just buy it. It's like, you know, not a con- and he never gave it back. That's hilarious. Yeah. And that's funny, she said, everybody hates uh, the uh, Barnes and Noble because they are really eating up small bookshops, really. True. But I'm surprised he said that in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I think my kind of final thought on, on anything, and, and you know, Jared can sort of speak to where things are headed and, and the future and everything, but I, I did, um, I really thought it was cool when they started talking about other printed material and ephemera and, you know, looking at um, the kind of holistic approach to archiving and talking about Woody Guthrie's uh, collection and, and Bob Dylan and everything. But um, I just, I love this idea of, of why that's important. And um, when um, Susan Orlean was talking about having to go back to Columbia because she was doing mm-hmm. research, so she had to go back to access her own notes. Um, and I just, I, I think that's something that that is something really cool for younger generations to, um, you know, when they were, you know, showing, I was at James Baldwin's notes on like the cocktail napkin, but like this idea that whether it's an artist or a writer or a filmmaker or a performer that they are, you know, constantly creating and part of the, and, and to be able to capture parts of that process and be able to go back and, and kind of get a context for, you know, where this great novel came from or where this great, you know, album came from or this piece of work um, artwork so I just I thought that was very cool and for me that's like a hook for people that are, aren't like I really just love books and the smell of books which is a legitimate thing that I literally miss all the time is like the smell of the stacks and the books but people who aren't into that but might be like yeah but that's really a cool approach to 
um, you know, collecting history and, and kind of archiving uh, the work of a particular artist. So that to me was a, a cool way of thinking about um, where things are going in the future in terms of book selling and, and, um, and collecting. Jared, Yukari, do you have any final thoughts? I would say my final thoughts are just, um, yeah, if you don't have used bookstores around you, um, do library, you know, library book sales, um, especially with kids, bring, bring kids to like library book sales. I mean, they're there, just that, that um, the joy, it's not rare books, um, but just being able to go and actually indulge and just like, Hoover things up for you know not much mm -hmm. money and just to really appreciate this kind of owning and collecting and, and um, buying you know um, books um, they don't have to be expensive you just cherish them and enjoy them and that'll kind of help foster this lifelong appreciation for you know collecting and just enjoying and having. Yeah, yeah. Something about bookstore, you know. I I still have a lot. I mean that I can't read so many. I don't say so many, but still go to the bookstore, something about it. I, it's, you know, many people can share what's just browsing and then going through. And still, to me, it's English is not Japanese bookstore being in the English store. It's different, but just, just going through something about, yeah, book has you no know, tangible, things um yeah it's, it's great <laughs> well thank you um we do have one last quick question from craig smith again uh this can be a real quick answer um in the movie there's a lot of eccentric personalities of the booksellers um <laughs> these people are like that in real life that's normally just how they are yeah yeah. I'm trying to think of which one, whether it's Nick Lowry in the mustache. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you might recognize me at Peaks Roadshow. So, but no, everybody in that was, that's that's who they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah. Nobody's hamming it up for the screen. Gotcha. Nobody, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. um, guys, thank you so much for coming. Um, I am going to, uh, in about 10 seconds, unmute everybody. If we could all just give... Uh, Jared and Lisa and Yukari, a big round of applause. That would be greatly because <laughs> um, otherwise it's just me and it's awkward. So uh, <laughs> give me one second. All right, I'm going to unmute you all and round, big round of applause. Oh. And there we go. Okay, I was going to say, no, okay. it's just me. Okay, cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, you can go to uh, artsquest.org, uh, steelstacks.org. You can see a whole bunch of stuff we have for ArtsQuest at home. A um, lot of great stuff on there. Uh, in terms of movie talks, um, tomorrow we have uh, Toy Story at 7.30 with Addison, uh, uh, Addison Young and I doing that. On Wednesday, we have Carrie, the 70s uh, horror film, very iconic uh, with Lauren Tassi. Um, and then uh, you know, we have a, great, a lot of great comedy shows. Uh, Lisa, do you have anything you want to promote? Uh, just, you know, uh, the entire uh, roster of programming that we're doing through Arts Quest at Home, a lot of visual arts workshops, um, you know, that you could do yourself or with your kids with uh, materials around the house. Um, some are book arts related, um, which is very cool. We have a lot of printmaking ones in there and things like that. Uh, and educational, we do a story time. I do story time every Thursday at 10 with my son, uh, Henry, live streamed on the Banana Factory's Facebook page. So check that out too. And uh, follow uh, the Watson Library on Instagram or Facebook, especially Instagram if you want to get some great visuals of cool, unique books. Uh, Jared and Yukari are, are on there quite a bit, but that's a great follow if, if you are a book lover. All right. Well, with all that, guys, we thank you so much. Again, if you've enjoyed this and you want to, uh, you know, consider making a donation, please go to artsquest.org slash donate. And if not, hey, thank you for coming. We really were glad you're here. Uh, yeah. So thank you guys and uh, have a great night. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thank everybody. you, Jared. Thank Thanks. you, Yukari. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony.